So everybody is talking about Kubernetes, but migrating to it is often easier said than done. Noah Kantrowitz runs an infrastructure team at RideCell, and he's going to show us what they tried, what they learned, and how to do it. Please make Noah feel welcome. Awesome, thanks so much, Lee. Um, like they said, uh, Noah Kantrowitz, that's me in all of the places. You can't actually see it, it is on the bottom of the slides, but oh well. Um, I work in a startup called RideCell uh, over in America. Um, we do car stuff, but not really relevant to this talk. Um, deploying web applications is really hard. There's a lot of individual bits, they have to happen in the right order, over and over, it has to be fast, has to be easy to use, and has to be error-free every single time. Uh, in the beginning, back at the dawn of operations, we all basically just did this by hand, maybe some people had some bash scripts, maybe some rsync if you were real fancy, uh, but it was extremely slow, it was very tedious, there were lots of errors, uh, and it took a lot of human hours. So in time, we had new tools, things like Fabric, Chef, and Ansible, those helped automate all of our processes, and then we got new things like Docker and the rest of the container ecosystem that helped us move stuff from uh, deploy time to build time and generally improve our repeatability. But with all of these new tools came a lot of new challenges. So let's set the stage for the application we're gonna be talking about here. This is not a hypothetical. This is the actual application that my team works on at my company. Um, it is a fairly standard Django monolith. We're still on Python 2, feel free to boo later. Uh, so that means Django 1, it's not really relevant, Python 2 versus Python 3 or Django 1 versus 2 for deployment, so it doesn't actually change very much. Um, we've got Celery for background tasks and channels for WebSockets. Um, Postgres as our SQL database, Redis as a cache, Rabbit for Celery. Fairly standard, big Django web application. Um, we do have one slightly special thing, um, which is that we deploy a single copy uh, of a single tenant application per customer. Um, the main reason we do this is so that we can have customers on different versions, although it does as a sort of side benefit mean that there's a much lower chance of a code bug, meaning customers can see each other's data. The only thing that's really relevant for this is that it means we deploy a lot more copies of our application than most other people, but it's all the same problems as everyone has, we just have more of them. Um, <laughs> So what the old deployment system looked like. Um, the whole application was AWS based. Uh, our company does use Google Cloud for some other things, but this application was all on AWS. Uh, main two tools were Terraform for the initial provisioning, although wrapped up in some big Python scripts so that we could deal with all the things that didn't support Terraform. Um, and then Ansible for configuring the system and also Ansible for deploying the application code itself. Uh, secrets lived in Ansible Vault, and access control to the systems themselves was controlled by who had an SSH key. So if your SSH key is on the machine, you can deploy to that machine. It's a solid setup, it was very automated, it was fairly easy to work with, we could push deploys left, right, and center, uh, but it did have some issues. Uh, launching a new instance of the application was fairly time consuming, it was a couple hours from someone on my team. It's all automated, but you gotta run the scripts in the right order and check every step to make sure that things happen properly and that like the cloud didn't oops one of your machines. Um, similarly, this doesn't really support auto scaling and even manual scaling was fairly time consuming of setting up a new machine, again, making sure that it joined the cluster properly, all that kind of stuff wasn't great. Um, we do also have a bunch of Django-based microservices. I'm just kind of ignoring them for the moment. Uh, we're gonna focus on just this one big monolithic application. So we did have some constraints on our change. Uh, we knew we wanted to stick with Kubernetes for container management. We're already using it for microservices and it's my personal weapon of choice for container wrangling. Uh, additionally, we knew we wanted to keep using RDS for SQL and Cloud AMQP for RabbitMQ. Um, I'm overall actually fairly in favor of running databases in Kubernetes compared to most people, but I have a small operations team. If I can trade money for not having to run a database, I'm pretty much always going to do that. Additionally, it made the migration easier because we didn't have to move production databases around. So what do I mean by a forklift migration? Uh, this term, for me at least, means I can make some changes to the backend application. I, you know, I have a, a good working relationship with all the backend teams, but the overall goal was pick up the current code base and just slot it into Kubernetes with as few changes as possible. Before I start talking specifics, um, just define some jargon that I'm gonna be using here and there for people that haven't worked with Kubernetes before. Um, a container is a cool way to run a process inside a whole bunch of security flags, and an image is the larval form of a container. It contains all the stuff that you need to create a new container. Uh, Kubernetes has many things to many people, but the most important thing for this talk is it's an API, so there's an actual like REST API that you can talk to to make your containers do stuff. Launch them, create more, shut them down, um, make them jump through hoops so that your containers are actually useful. It's very rare that a single container in isolation is really gonna do very much work for you. In general, you're gonna need a whole bunch of different containers doing different things, and Kubernetes puts that behind a REST API. Pods are a Kubernetes specific term. It mostly means the same thing as container, but with a couple extras. So when you hear me say pod, if that's confusing to you, just mentally replace that with the word container. All right, all that laid out, I was ready to roll up my sleeves and jump in moving my application to Kubernetes. 
first step in containerizing any application is to make a container image. Uh, Multi-stage builds in Docker, they're not even that new anymore. Um, they were added a couple years ago, and they're especially useful for dealing with things like this, big Python applications. Um, the idea of a multi-stage build is you have two separate images, one for the build and one for the runtime image. Uh, usually the build image is going to be a lot bigger. You need a Python compiler and the headers, or sorry, C compiler, uh, all the headers, all that stuff. You want to build all of your packages, and then you dump just the necessary files into your runtime image, along with like making a user and all the little sort of minor things. So this runtime image is going to be a lot smaller and leaner. My first attempt to get things set up in Kubernetes, I decided we're not going to deal with automation, just can I get a manual proof of concept working, writing a whole lot of YAML by hand. Um, Fitting a whole Kubernetes YAML file on screen is basically impossible. You would never be able to read it. So this is just uh, a small subsection of the container definition. Um, but here's the general idea. Uh, we're going to launch a container. It's going to run our migrations. Uh, and then it's going to exec into GUnicorn. Fairly simple. Um, it's going to mount up the configuration data from a, uh, you can't actually see it, but from a config map. Um, so this gives us a fairly simple Django environment. Um, but there are some problems with this. Uh, it means every time the container restarts, it's going to attempt to run the migrations. So we can move that to a thing called an init container, um, which is a Kubernetes abstraction for before you actually run your application, do some stuff. Um, good start, but if we tried to run two copies of our pod, if we wanted, say, redundancy or some additional load capacity, um, they're both going to try to run the migrations, which is not usually a fun thing with Django. Um, so. Uh, additionally, we had to figure out how we were going to fit um, channels and celery into this. But overall, this gives you sort of a very basic idea of the manual version of this. Um, you just write versions of this over and over until you have all the different types of things. You need Gunicorn, you need CelerID, um, you need CelerYBeat, and you need uh, the various WebSockets things. We're actually on an old version of WebSockets, so it's still using the channel worker system. Andrew can feel free to make fun of me later. Um, but yeah, so. So keeping track, so we had uh, other pods for dealing with Celery, Daphne, and channel workers. Um, Celery beats I would have needed to deal with, but I just actually ignored for this initial prototype. Um, static file handling. For the old system, we were dealing with them through uh, Django storages and uploading them to S3. Um, because we're an API-driven environment, we do have some web UIs, but they're mostly for like admin consoles and stuff, so we decided, screw it, let's just put all of that locally. Um, it helps to simplify the deployment process. We didn't have to like deploy and then sync something up to S3 or deal with tracking what things in S3 are in use. Um, so they're just all serving from a little local web server. It's called Caddy. Um, it's faster than like Django Run Server, but it's still handling it all locally. Um, I haven't really mentioned ingresses, and I'm not going to go into them too deeply because we'd be here all day. Um, but I was using the traffic ingress controller um, to deal with routing between uh, the G Unicorn, the Daphne server, and the static file server because those are all split up very easily based on URL prefixes. Um, and finally, I said that I wanted to use RDS, but for some of the initial testing phases, uh, booting an RDS database takes about 20 minutes, and I didn't want to have to wait that long every time. So we started out using local Postgres through a thing called Postgres Operator instead. Um, but then sort of slowly switched over to RDS as things got a little bit more stable. Um, but okay, I had a working proof of concept. This did work, but it was extremely verbose. Didn't really handle migrations very well, as we mentioned. Uh, and it was not exactly easy to replicate this from one uh, environment to the next. We would have had to copy the whole manifest, edit out the different config pieces that are different between customers and stuff. Not a great solution. So. The next tool in the standard Kubernetes quiver is a thing called Helm. It calls itself the Kubernetes Package Manager. Uh, and the overall idea is very similar to what we had before. Uh, I'm not going to dive in too much into the chart itself, because it's going to look basically the same as we had before, just with more curly braces for variable replacements. But it looks kind of like Django templates. Um, but the idea is we take all of that YAML that we saw before, and we slot it into a big old Helm chart. And then we rubber stamp out our Helm chart for each environment that we need. Um, this did improve some things. Um, it meant that we could store just the values that differ between environments as opposed to having giant piles of repeated YAML. Um, the templating system is very easy to use. Uh, it's great for community support. Most of the Kubernetes community uses Helm. We even used it for some other things already. Um, 
but it did bring some problems. Uh, it didn't really do much to fix the ordering and sequencing problems. There is a system in Helm called hooks that lets you say, like, please run this command before or after you, you do your Helm deploy. We're hoping that we could use that for managing migrations, but it turned out to be fairly error prone, and more importantly, the debugging when hooks fail, when the migrations failed, uh, was almost impossible. So it didn't really actually fix that problem very much. Um, also, there's basically no testing tools for Helm. It does have a thing called Helm test that you would think is useful for testing, but actually that doesn't do very much. Um, so if you want to write unit integration tests, which I really, really did, um, you're kind of going to have to build your own massive complicated scripting harness. Uh, additionally, secrets management, they basically just say not our problem. There's a lot of plugins for managing it, all of which work completely differently. Um, but overall, Helm doesn't really give you much there other than, sorry, figure it out with your own scripts. Uh, and then the final problem, Tiller. Uh, this is a server-side component of Helm 2. Um, it has already been removed in Helm 3, which is not currently available. Um, there is an early alpha build that doesn't actually work yet. Um, they are working on removing Tiller, like it's already been removed in master. Um, but if you want to actually use Helm today, that means Helm 2, and that means you have Tiller. Um, Tiller is a security nightmare. Um, there are workarounds for dealing with it. You can run multiple copies of it all over the place with different security contexts. Um, but usually the way that you're going to use Tiller is you are going to give it root permissions on your entire Kubernetes cluster, which means that anyone can talk, that can talk to it also has root permissions on your entire Kubernetes cluster. Um, this did not make me happy as an infrastructure engineer. Um, so overall, Helm definitely helped with some stuff. We could rubber stamp out our environments very, very quickly and very error-free, um, but we didn't really have the, the right state machine modeling. So uh, we moved on to version three. Um, this is our hopefully final approach. Uh, we'll see how long this lasts as, as saying final. Um, but the idea was to write a Kubernetes operator. Um, Kubernetes operators as a general concept tie together three main things. Uh, CRDs, custom resource definitions, uh, watches, and controllers. And we'll go through all three of those now. A custom resource definition, or CRD, because I'm not going to say all of those words forever, uh, adds a new object type into Kubernetes. So for anyone that's worked with Kubernetes or seen my jargon definition before, things like pods or services or ingresses, those are types of objects in Kubernetes. They're things, you can put them in YAML, they have properties, all that stuff. CRDs let you define new object types and add them to Kubernetes so that it will allow those objects in the API just like everything else. So here, we are, our application is called summon, uh, or summon platform, depending on how formal you want to be. So we defined a new object type. Um, if you, you can basically imagine this just says Django app. We are giving that to Kubernetes as a top level type. Um, and then you can use that and just have a sort of reduced definition. It's a little bit more boilerplate-y than just recording the, the differences between environments like we did with Helm, but it's fairly clean. Um, you can see what version we are deploying. We turned the debug flag on to true. It's got a name, it's got a namespace. Pretty simple all around. Um, this is a valid Kubernetes object. If you have the CRD installed, this is a thing that the Kubernetes API will accept. Uh, but they don't do anything on their own. CRDs just add APIs, they add data storage, but we have to actually set up an implementation of those objects to power them. The way that we do that is through custom controllers, and the way that controllers do that is through a thing called watches. Uh, a watch is a, a piece of the Kubernetes API where you can say, for every object of type X, please tell me every time an object of those changes. So you can basically subscribe to changes or watch for changes in the Kubernetes uh, API as if it were a database. So the general heart of every controller uh, is going to be these three things. Set up a watch for some type of object. Every time one of those objects changes, run, uh, it's generally called a reconcile, though you could also say a converge or whatever, the same thing as like Chef or Ansible uses. Take that new object that just changed and use that to reconfigure whatever it was managing. Repeat forever. Um, before we talk in, dive in too much to talk about the specific or Django controller, uh, let's talk a little bit generally about convergent systems. So uh, before we even say convergence, what is the opposite? A procedural system. Uh, this is when you design a system by giving it every step that you want to take in what order you want it to take them. Um, so every step of the owl. <laughs> as opposed to a convergent system where we don't tell it what steps we want to take. Instead, we just say, this is what we want the system to look like when you're done. Figure out what to do. Um, and the system will work out all the details of which pieces to change, so on and so forth. 
Uh, and two other sort of important concepts in convergent system design, idempotence, very fancy word, all it means is that the system doesn't take action unless it needs to. Again, this is also used in things like Chef and Ansible and Puppet. Uh, if a package is already installed, do not reinstall it. If a pod is already running, do not start another copy of it. Um, and then promise theory. This one's a little bit more complicated, so I can't go into all the details, but it's a mathematical description and framework for breaking a convergent system down into smaller convergent systems. These are called actors, um, and each actor provides a promise or a contract to the rest of the world of, if you give me this input, I will do this thing, and I will keep trying to do it over and over, even if I fail, until I manage to do the thing that I promised. So why does this matter? Uh, because being successful with Kubernetes basically requires that you rethink your deployment, generally from a procedural system to a convergent one. Uh, most deployment systems are at least originally written as some kind of bash script, possibly via Ansible, but like they're generally do step one, then step two, then step three, then step four. Um, and you'll see we do have some sequencing in here, especially dealing with migrations, but overall the idea is to instead think of this as what state do I want the system to be in when I am done with each step? Um, and trying to sort of limit the number of steps to only the places that we actually need a formal boundary. So migrating versus migrations are done, that's a formal boundary, but after migrations are done, we can just sort of tell it, and this is what the system should look like. I want 15 copies of my web server and I want 16 copies of Celery D, make it happen. Um, so why does Kubernetes use these patterns in the first place? Um, again, Complicated issue, but the overall problem with procedural management of these big distributed massive systems is that stuff drifts over time. Um, you end up with a failure here, a failure there, this machine reboots and now it's in a slightly different state. Uh, unless you write your procedural code very carefully, it has to account for every possible starting state to reach the desired end state, as opposed to designing convergently, where all you give it is the end state and a whole bunch of ways to reach that desired end state. Um, so you don't have to separately account for every possible starting condition. All right, so that's the general theory. Back to talking about our actual controller. Um, so controllers can be used for all kinds of things in Kubernetes. There's lots of weird ones already built in, but for custom controllers, they usually follow this pattern. You're going to have a root object. In our case, it is called summon platform. Um, use that to generate a whole bunch of other Kubernetes objects or sometimes to do like non-Kubernetes-y things, but for the, the, the simple ones, um, our summon platform object, all it's really doing, all this controller is doing is dealing with the ordering and sequencing of creating a whole bunch of other Kubernetes objects and talking back into the API for those. Um, so this loop will run every single time. So every time a summon platform changes, it goes through all of these, so create a bunch of deployments, create a bunch of services, create a bunch of ingresses, uh, make sure that they match, we have a bunch of templates in our code, um, make sure they match what we want for the requested input configuration on that summon platform object we saw a bunch of slides ago. Um, this helps to ensure that we don't get drift, as we mentioned before. Uh, if anything is ever changing, the controller will get a notification. It'll see that, hey, look, the some platform object changed, and it'll just fix whatever is running in Kubernetes. Uh, <laughs> So enough about the ideas, where's the code? Unfortunately, writing complex operators in Python is doable, but it's currently a bit tricky. Um, there are a couple of projects that are trying. Kopf and Metacontroller are the two major ones, but they're still very early in development, and they're probably not really suitable for large-scale use. So we wrote this in Go. Um, KubeBuilder is the most official of the, the tools for doing this. Um, so even though we are a Python company and I personally like Python, obviously, or I wouldn't be here, um, we did write this whole thing in Go instead. Uh, hopefully you won't hold that against me. But, okay. So we sort of talked about this before of we need the state machine to figure out how we sort of sequence and manage things, but now that we're into talking about controllers, here's the actual state machine. Um, so initializing, migrating, deploying, ready, and error. Um, initializing is all of the one-time setup stuff, booting the database, setting up Redis, setting up the RabbitMQ stuff. Uh, migrating means I have detected that the version that I am deploying is not the last version I ran migrations for. Please run Django migrations. Um, and deploying means the migrations have happened successfully. Please launch all of my new containers with a new version. Ready means all of those containers have launched successfully. And error means something went wrong. Um, so we generally follow these just in a linear order. It's a really simple state machine. Uh, we want it to keep this as thin as possible, um, but this gives us fairly reasonable control over having all of our Django stuff happen in the right order. 
Uh, since the original is in Go, as I mentioned, here's sort of a Python-y example of how some of this stuff works. Um, so here's how we handle migrations, for example. Um, if the input, spe if the spec version, the input version that we want to deploy matches the last version we ran migrations for, we're good, we're done, exit. Otherwise, uh, try to start the migrations. If the migration succeeded, set the migrate version. Otherwise, we're currently running the migrations. So this kind of logic, the, the advantage of controllers over something like Helm, or one of the advantages, is that you can actually write this in code. With Helm, you're limited to just the features that Helm exposes. You have to use their hook system, because that's all you have. With a controller, uh, you can mix and match. So most of our code is relatively declarative. It's basically the same as it would be in Helm or Ansible or whatever. But when we need the power of an actual programming language, we have it available. Um, uh, now just sort of some, some specific stuff as advice for anyone that may have to deal with this in the future. Um, Celery Beat is a royal pain to run. Um, because it is a stateful service, um, like web services, uh, channels, all that stuff, they're all stateless. You can shut them down and start them back up, and they don't care. Celery Beat is special because it has to maintain state of which of the, of the, the scheduled tasks have run and when. Because of this, uh, you have two basic options for dealing with this. Um, the first one is to run it as what's called a stateful set. Um, that is a tool in Kubernetes that is designed to help running stateful applications. Um, you can totally do that, but it does require persistent storage for storing the statefulness of it, and that can be tricky. Um, we have currently a slight recurring failure in Amazon that persistent storage doesn't always work right. Um, or there is a tool called Celery BDEX. Um, BDEX, uh, lets you move the stateful storage into a Redis database. Um, so as opposed to having to deal with local disk storage, you can put it into your cache where it's a little bit easier to deal with. Um, BDEX also solves another problem. Uh, normally, if you run two copies of Celery Beat, you will end up with two copies of most of your scheduled tasks, which is not what you want. BDEX has a fairly simple leader election process. Um, so you can run multiple copies for redundancy without having to deal with all of the madness of uh, your own leader election system. Um, there is also Django Celery Beat, which lets you store the state in the Django database, but it also does a whole lot more than that. Like it sets up a web UI for manipulating your scheduled tasks, which I didn't want anyone doing. Um, also, uh, we have tasks that run every second, so this generates a lot of load on our SQL database, and we didn't really want to do that. Redis is generally a better fit. There is a but, uh, or I wouldn't be giving you two options. BDEX is Python 3 only, and as mentioned, I'm not currently running Python 3. Hopefully you all are, and you do not have to deal with this, and you can just use the nice thing, but I can't have the nice thing. Um, so I'm doing it the stateful set way. Please don't if you can't. <laughs> um, all right, database management. Um, so we dealt with this by making more custom types and custom controllers. Um, we wanted to have a, a slight abstraction for local versus RDS databases. Um, so we wrote a new type called Postgres database of just give me a database. If I'm running in dev, make it locally. If I'm running in prod, give me RDS, all that kind of stuff. Um, one of the nice things about controllers is that you can Custom controllers and custom types can use other custom controllers and other custom types because as far as Kubernetes is concerned, they're all the same thing. Um, Kubernetes just sees API calls and API types. Uh, so you can nest these as deeply as you want. Some of them get a little bit squirrely, but you can create tools and then use them in your own code. Um, App configuration is a little bit of a complex thing because your environment is now extremely dynamic, um, dealing with things like, what is my database password? Um, we wanted to automate that so we didn't have to like record it somewhere, um, randomly generate passwords, store them in a Kubernetes secret, pull them back out, and put them into the Django config. Again, this is pseudocode because the real one is in Go, but this lives in our, our summon controller, and it will dynamically generate a YAML config file that we then feed into Django. And I am running low on time, so I'm gonna try and speed through this a little bit. Uh, that covers the sort of tech behind our deployment system. Uh, but what about the workflow? Uh, as I mentioned way back when, we sort of started with a deploy.sh script. It, it's a little bit more complicated than this because it's got some like input verification, but it basically boils down to this. Run Ansible playbook with a limit and some tags and an extra vars. Um, the idea of defining sources of truth in a system uh, means you try to map out what is authoritative for each piece of information in your system. So for example, with our Ansible code, the playbooks and roles, they live in Git, and they are authoritative for how do you configure a thing. Um, but a problem with our old system was 
the, the source code for the config management lived in Git, but what version was deployed where, that didn't really live anywhere. It definitely didn't live in Git. It kind of lived on each system based on the state of a Git repository, uh, but that's not great. Um, this also comes up a lot with people that use Jenkins for deployment, that you'll make a nice parameterized job, uh, and you can sort of fill in a version to deploy. That's great, but that means that the record of what version lives where is in a Jenkins build log. Uh, not great. Um, so, uh, a related issue to this is uh, drift. Um, so over time, your system will sort of slowly, uh, as we said, there'll be failures, things will move uh, out of config. So we came up with this idea of, well not we, the internet came up with the idea of GitOps, um, where Git is your only source of truth. Um, all configuration goes in a file in a Git repository. Usually they're giant piles of YAML because that's just how ops rolls. Um, but you have something that watches those Git repositories. Someone makes a pull request or whatever uh, source control abstraction you use. Uh, it gets merged. The automation sees that there has been a, a commit to the correct branch. It wakes up and it applies that config. So the only way to affect change on the entire system is to make a change in Git. Um, this is a lot of benefits. Uh, I am a real big fan of this approach. Um, you get continuous drift resolution. Um, if anyone, say, like they go into prod and they just manually change something because that happens from time to time, whether or not it should, uh, the next time there is a change, because the entire state of the system lives in Git, the next time anything happens, the system will check. It'll see, oh, look, this is out of date. I'm fixing it for you. Um, so over time, Drift will be continuously fixed for you. Um, it also helps with disaster recovery. Again, the whole state of the system is in one or more Git repositories, so you do a deploy through your normal deploy stuff, and all of your stuff is back. Um, and you get to have a sort of unified workflow between code and infrastructure changes. You can use code reviews, you get logs. It's useful as a sort of discount audit logging system. Um, you, get, you get to see who made changes and when. Hopefully they put a good commit message on it, um, or there are review comments that you can look at to figure out why people made changes. Um, so we put all of this together, our custom types, our custom operators, GitOps, um, and this is what our new deployment workflow looks like. Um, so uh, there is a big GitHub repository for all of our deployments. Somebody finds the correct YAML file for the thing that they want to change the version of, or they create a new YAML file if they're making a new deployment. Um, they, they make a PR, changing a version field or whatever else. Someone approves that, it gets merged. Uh, we use Argo CD as the thing that watches the GitHub repository. So it sees that there's been a change in Git. It applies the new YAML file out into Kubernetes. The operator wakes up. It sees, oh look, somebody changed a summon platform object in the Kubernetes API. I'm going to go and start a deploy. Um, and really running out of time, so going through this real quick, um, some other pieces that we wrote that can be very helpful. We wrote a command line tool to interface the system. We called it ride cuddle because ride cell. Um, but shell, pi shell, and db shell are just sort of helper commands for give it an instance name and it'll go and find, uh, give you a, an xx shell or the, the Django shell or a Postgres shell. Um, and we also took a cue from the, the homebrew book and we wrote a command called doctor that checks your environment and tries to figure out like what is wrong with your environment. Like maybe you don't have a Kubernetes config, that's why nothing is going to work. Um, it can also automatically fix things in cases that they're simple enough to automatically fix. And uh, quick bonus round, um, we, I, I personally like command lines. I'm super happy with kubectl describe as my way to get information about the system, but we do have a lot of people at my company that are less console focused, and that's great. So uh, this is very new. Um, we haven't actually even deployed this to prod yet, so a little bit of a preview if anyone at my company is watching this later. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, we wrote a very simple read-only web interface just to give people some way to access state information. Um, we hope to improve this over time, but hopefully this will give people a little bit more transparency into the system if they're not Kubernetes console jockeys. Um, uh, and like I said, uh, this is all in Go, but it is also all open source. Um, it's not particularly well documented, but if you would like to go look at this, uh, it is all there. Um, GitHub org, ride cell, um, ride cell operator is the operator, ride cuddle is the command line tool. Um, it's all super tailored for us, but if you wanna like take some code and remix it, reuse it anywhere else, uh, we welcome you to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got like 60 seconds for questions, so probably mostly just come up and talk to me. Uh, I can take like one or two questions. Um, but otherwise, I'll be up here. Test? Yes. Do you know how interested the community 
is ecosystem is in Python in general, or do you think it's worthwhile investing in Go to interact with it at the moment? The question was how, how invested is the Kubernetes ecosystem in Python? Medium. Um, there is a, a fairly decent um, sort of low-level client library um, that's mostly auto-generated from the giant uh, uh, the proto buffer code. Um, so that works okay. But the sort of higher level tools, not so much. Uh, there's interest, but there's not a lot of like money behind it. So it's going to move slowly as compared to the Go stuff. All right. I think that's all the time we have. If anyone else has any questions, please come up. Uh, but other than that, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Noah.